On today's episode of Creation.com Talk, we are sitting here in the studio talking about Big Bang, aliens, and a recent government report, recent as in July of 2021, um, talking about the U.S. military and whether or not they've actually seen UFOs. I'm Dr. Robert Carter, and I am sitting in the studio with... Hey, I'm Gary Bates. We're both from uh, the U.S. office of Creation Ministries International. So, Rob, yes, uh, one of President Trump's last edicts before he left was a coronavirus bill, but included in that bill was a mandate that the U.S. military, all branches of the U.S. military, had to report to the Senate Intelligence Committee their findings on UFOs. And I've got some stats here because there have been four previous investigations uh, by the U.S. uh, government starting right back in the 1960s with Project Blue Book, very, very famous. They made a History uh, Channel documentary on that. And you talk about that in your book, Alien Intrusion. Yes, and we've got articles on our website as well. Uh, But this was specifically for sightings between 2004 and 2021. So only... Yeah. So not going all the way back to the beginning of the sightings. Wow. No, and, okay. I, and I'll tell you why, because just prior to this, for the few years prior to this, even in the Obama administration, for the first time, and I've been studying this for over 20 years, and for the very first time, the US government openly acknowledged there was stuff that we were seeing that they could not explain. All these other reports kind of whitewashed it. Well, you know, it could be this, it could be that. Yeah. But they so we never, know what Roswell was. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's clear. Yeah. military stuff, and yeah. but other things later on. Well, the U.S. military started to drip feed the media with sightings, you know, of their pilots, uh, of these objects being seen on radar, and then, uh, or, you know, performing maneuvers that... No, well, hold, hold, pause. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> U.S. military people have gone on record and are willing to testify that they have seen unidentified objects... Visually and on screen. Yeah, that's nothing new. They, they've been. You see, it, I say it, I say it that way because a lot of people listening are be like, "What? It's real?" Yeah. Okay. So in Alien Intrusion, if people want to watch the movie Alien Intrusion and Masking a, de- a Deception, we showed highlights of a press conference in Washington in 2010 at the yep. at Washington Press Club, where over 80 Air Force officers, not just enlisted guys, 80 Air Force officers, gave their testimonies about tracking UFOs that were defying the laws of physics, flying at thousands of miles an hour, doing right angle turns, not slowing down. And shockingly, they said they've even interfered with our nuclear weapons. Now, it was very easy for people to dismiss that. But then, under the Obama administration, Senator Harry Reid, who was a majority yeah. leader in the House, he was one of the promulgators of this investigation. He is on record, and you can watch it on YouTube elsewhere, of saying that these things have affected our nuclear capability to the extent that if the president needed to order a launch, he couldn't. So, yes, these are serious. These are real. When you have our government officials saying this. the allegations are serious. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and the witnesses are... Credible. Credible. Yep, yep. There's no question about it. So here's what they came up with. There was 150, 144 UAP reports. What's UAP? Okay. UAP? So they don't like to use the term UFO anymore because historically that's, you know, Star Wars stuff. It's aliens coming from another planet. So UAPs are unidentified aerial phenomena. 144 of them. alien phenomena. Aerial phenomena. Did I say alien? No, no, you said aerial. Okay. But I'm just making sure everyone (laughs) heard that. They didn't use the word alien. Aerial phenomena. Um, They said that they clearly pose a safety of flight issue. This is what the report said, and pose a challenge to U.S. national security. Some UAP appeared to be or remain stationary in winds aloft against the wind, maneuver abruptly. In other words, we don't have conventional vehicles that can do these types of things. They move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. Yeah, There's no, no engines, no rockets, no jets. In a small number of cases, military aircraft systems processed radio frequencies or high energy bursts okay. coming from them. And they said the conclusion was a handful of them seemed to demonstrate advanced technology. So, of course, the $64,000 question is, yeah, what are they? What are they? Now, the most, of, most of these reports can probably be discounted as natural phenomena, machine error, 
things yeah. like that. But a significant number of them can't, and that's what we're questioning. Yeah. So what tends to happen is a lot of people, I get a lot of emails and say, well, it's obviously secret government technology. Yeah, yeah the government does have secret technology, but they don't fly it around in public view. And they don't defy the laws of physics. <laughs> you know, they've got bases like Area 51 where yeah. they do develop secret technology like stealth technology, uh, et cetera. So this was a real U-turn, Rob, uh, in all the years and all the reports for the government finally to acknowledge them, one, and finally to acknowledge that they are interfering with, you know, in a, in a holistic way, us at many, many levels. They've been seen to affect our environment. And I predicted, if you recall, I predicted many years ago that what we would see is a, a change because it's a yeah. bit like you can't cover these up anymore. And I said, I think we're going to be prepared for an announcement by governments around the world in the future that possibly we are being visited by extraterrestrials. Now, the report didn't say that. It did not. But in previous reports, they've always thrown cold water on that. This does not represent any alien technology. They did not say that this time. They said it may. Because I think what happens, I think this is a step towards something. Because okay. here's the thing. If people are familiar with alien intrusion in our work, they will know that with a small percentage of this, it defies naturalistic explanation. We think there's spiritual uh, deception going on, particularly in the yeah. area of abductions, which we're not going to talk about today. That's where we can challenge it. But for a government, for an official organization, they don't recognize the spiritual world, right? They're, they're not right. going to do that. They're going to try to look at this in a naturalistic sense. And ultimately, I think their conclusion is, well, if these things seem to fly intelligently, are guided intelligently, um, then it's representing a technology that's far beyond our own, hence the conclusion, aliens. And yet no one's ever seen one up close or always like in the distance far away sort of things? Well, no. I mean, there I mean, are a lots big of- ship has flown up next to a 747. The guy looks out and sees a little gray guy sitting at the controls. No one's ever seen that, right? Uh, well, no, they have. <laughs> people, okay, people claim but, this. But they are, they are anecdotal, okay, right? Okay. So I've met lots of people who say they've seen them. They saw the thing land um, and in fact, there have been marks and impressions on the ground. Okay. So if we... But it, saying it's anecdotal is very, very important. Because here we have the government saying this is not anecdotal. And here's a class of things that they have witnessed and they've documented and they're willing to say it in public. Well, one of these, the last one they released before the report came out, was that was tracked by military aircraft, tracked on Navy ships, flew at incredible speeds, and then hit the water and submerged into the water at incredible speeds. So, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize you can't do those things. No, you can't hit water while flying fast. That's disintegration possibility. So, so here's, here's the thing, Rob. In the 20 years I've been doing this, you know, there are two views. There's one that was typically we called the extraterrestrial hypothesis, which yeah. we see in science fiction. Aliens are flying light years across the, you know, the, the galaxy in faster than light spaceships. We now know, and we're going to talk about that, that the laws of physics presents that. After 70 years of investigating this, the most popular view amongst serious ufologists, people that study UFOs, and yeah. I'm talking about non-Christian interpreters. And people that you have spoken to personally. And yeah, MUFON, okay, yep. you'll find lots of people, is something called the interdimensional hypothesis. Okay. And in the movie Alien Intrusion and the book, we showed people like Harvard professor, Dr. John Mack, an atheist who says on record, on film, he says, these are spirit beings coming to us from another dimension. So no longer is it, you know, the, the critics can't say, well, you Christians, you are just trying to shoehorn that into your Christian worldview. In fact, the yeah, majority of the- Interdimensional sounds very much like spiritual. Exactly. Okay. So we Christians and non-Christians now, serious researchers I'm talking about, all right, um, will dis we'll, we'll agree about the nature of the phenomenon. Okay. Where we're going to, going to disagree is about its origin. Now, we're going to talk about Big Bang as part of this. Why? Because the Big Bang concept of evolution really can't account for what we would call a spiritual dimension. Now, they may right. appeal to multiverses and that string still theory. That's still physical. That still doesn't cover the spiritual parts. Uh, well, all those hy hypotheses are completely unproven. Yes, I that, mean, that you're resorting true. to unknowns to try to prove an unknown. Yep. Um, but the Bible has always said 
there is a spiritual realm. We're dealing with a creator who's outside of the physical universe, time and space that he created. All right. But what about the physical nature of these phenomena? You're telling me or you're telling the audience, you're telling people that, because I already know what you're going to say, but are you saying that spiritual beings can create physical phenomena? Uh, read the Bible. Boom. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, just recently, I knew this was coming out, so I wrote an article, Can Spirits Manifest Physically? I encourage you to go and look at that on creation.com. So let me give you an example. Here's one. Okay. So here's Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh. All right, we know the story. Aaron throws down his staff. God turns it into a snake. It says it's a snake. Yeah. Then the conjurers do the same. And when I talk to many Christians, I say, what do you think it is? I say, it's an illusion. But actually, it can't be because it says Aaron's snake ate the others. The snake. Which means when the snake turned him back into a staff, the other staffs weren't in the room anymore. They were gone. So here's the ability, even with demonic forces, of somehow manipulating matter or whatever it is. And, and we can't profess to be experts on that. But clearly, even God's angels have come in and affected our environment. Look at the yeah. destroying angel of Egypt. Yeah. They can kill people affect our world. Strong angel in David's time, the angels that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, physically touched Lot, they ate food yeah. with Abraham. Yeah. Okay. So I think one of the problems is as Christians, when we hear the word spirit, we just tend to think of something ethereal, yeah. ghostly, vaporous. But you and I are spiritual beings. Yeah. We exist physically. It's not the sum of who we are, it's part of who we are. And of course, when we look at the spiritual realm, we see through a glass very dimly because we can't go there, but clearly angels that exist in that realm can come here and affect our realm. So Now, that, that is fascinating. That's totally interesting. And it's not something that I considered before I met you. <laughs> and I remember hearing that some creationist had written this book about aliens. I kind of rolled my eyes and I found out he's moving to America to become my boss. And I was like, oh, no, I better read this book. And tell you what, the whole idea was so foreign to me. I'm assuming it's foreign to a lot of people watching this. Mm. It's not something most people consider that there really is a spirit realm. Even Christians, they really don't usually think of a spiritual battle going around us and spiritual beings interacting with us. And yet, as you said earlier, read the Bible. Yeah, well, it's full of it. I mean, God dispatches angels to do his bidding. It says that angels and good angels and, uh, and fallen angels fight. Yeah. All going on in the spiritual realm. The High Tech Cell is one of my all-time favorite presentations. As a geneticist, I'm trying to understand and describe the inner workings of the cell. But living things are far too complicated for simple analysis. So I compared the cell to a human-made computer. The genome is very much like a computer operating system, but it's much more complex than any computer operating system we've ever made. In fact, we write programs in lines of code. In math, a line is a one-dimensional object. Well, DNA is a linear molecule, so our computer program called the human genome is also one-dimensional. But here's where the genome and computers separate. That one-dimensional genome is filled with a two-dimensional interaction network of genes and proteins that control which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. That then folds into a complex three-dimensional structure that changes shape in the fourth dimension, time. Truly, the genome is a handiwork of an almighty God. The high-tech cell is available on DVD and streaming at creation.com store. Right. So, so we, we have to get to the question. So let's look at it from the secular point of view. If, these, if they think they are aliens, if the government does say, Christians, and watch out, don't fall for this, you know, we probably are being visited by extraterrestrials, um, their view would have to be based upon a naturalistic evolutionary Big Bang. And quite simply, from that point of view, if life evolved here on Earth when they look out in this incredibly vast universe, all right, all we now time, know there are... All those planets, all that probability, life must have evolved in other places also. Yeah. Maybe. Now, from that point of view, when we look at our Milky Way and our position in the universe, we would be in a relatively young part of the universe, according to Big Bang. So the further you look out, they would claim the further you are looking back in time. Therefore, those aliens could have evolved a million or a billion years in advance of human beings on the Earth. And therefore, they're a million or billion years advanced in right. their technology. That's how come they can build hyperdrive spaceships and visit the Earth. But here's where I'm going to pick you as a scientist, because okay. is it just a matter of advanced technology? People say, well, you could get craft that could fly 
at, you know, like like we see in Star Wars, at, and you know, hop into hyperspace or hyperspace. warp factor nine or something like that. At present, that is only science fiction. Hmm. Everything we know about science says it's not going to happen. Even if you can fly at light speed, you have no hope of crossing any significant part of the universe in any um, realistic amount of time. Or our galaxy. I just add one galaxy. Our Milky Way is 100,000 light years across, so at the speed of light, it would take you 100,000 years but, to cross even, it, right? Even at Star Trek velocities, pick a warp factor. What's the fastest warp speed ever flown on Star Trek? Maybe warp 10, maybe? Well, I think they did a futuristic episode, and it was maybe at warp factor 27, but no doubt our commenters will correct me on that. So. Okay, well, whatever that number is, even that is not enough. Yeah. Space is so big that you would be sitting in that, looking at your watch saying, wow, we might get there in a thousand years, maybe at the fastest possible speed. And that's only for a close star or something like that. It's Right. Now, so then, then on top of this, how many, there are billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies. Yeah. And in our own galaxy, there's probably 200 billion stars. Maybe okay. there are planets around them. Oh, definitely planets around them. How they habitable gonna, planets? That's a question. How are they going to find us? Yes, yeah. Lost in, in, well, yeah, but see, that's the Fermi paradox now. Let's jump ahead in the, in the outline here, right to the Fermi paradox. <laughs> All right. If the universe is as old as it is, and if evolution is at all probable, life would have evolved multiple times. It is possible that there is an alien civilization out there that's a million years more advanced than mm -hmm. us, even a billion years more advanced than us. Yep. Therefore, if there is life out there, it should have spread across the universe by yeah, now. Yeah, so a million years have answered us. So let's say they've developed light travel. Okay. And they go and send off an expedition somewhere. Okay. Colonize another planet. And then that planet now sends off another colonizing expedition. Right away or? Well, it can even wait another million years. Okay. I mean, in a 14 billion year old universe, what's a, what's a, what's a million yeah. years? And then the home planet also sends out another one. So and then you keep doing that. Exponential growth will very quickly populate the entire universe with those aliens. Very quickly. And in fact, we should be seeing hundreds of millions of alien civilizations yeah. everywhere. And that's why it's called the Fermi Paradox. Enrico Fermi postulated this. He was a physicist here in the United States. And basically, he said, where is everybody? Where, yeah. And that's a huge question. We like this. Because there isn't everybody. They're mm. not there. There's no evidence that aliens actually exist. Fermi, not unreasonably, based upon his evolutionary assumptions, also suggested that intelligent aliens will be curious explorers just like us. And in a 14 billion year old universe, there should have been plenty of time for at least the very first advanced races to send starships to colonize other planets. Even if it took millions of years for each colonizing effort, the new colony once established and the original civilization could each send out another expedition to colonize other planets, doubling the number of new colonies every million years. After 10 million years, there'd be over a thousand alien colonies. And after 20 million years, there'd be one million. At that rate, at 40 million years, there'd be one trillion civilizations. After 14 billion years, the number of alien civilizations in the universe will be tripping over each other. That's called the Fermi Paradox. Or in short, where is everybody? Now, all of this is predicated on the Big Bang. Yes. The Big Bang. Now, a lot of Christians say, well, God could have used the Big Bang, etc. But the I big, used to say that. The Big Bang is firmly part of the evolutionary paradigm of how the universe began. We want to call it cosmic evolution, whatever. But there are serious scientific problems with the Big Bang. So because yeah. if there's no Big Bang, then there's no way alien life can evolve. It's as simple yeah. as that. So let's talk about what the Big Bang is. It's, it's a belief that in the beginning there was nothing. Now, when we say nothing... Like nothing, nothing. <laughs> there's not even empty space. There is no universe. There's nothing. And out of this nothingness, a little you know, spec, particle. Yeah. Quantum fluctuation. A quantum produces... fluctuation causes a, a, this, this quantum particle, no bigger than the head of a pin, perhaps. Smaller than that. And then for some reason, this pinhead's worth of energy explodes, 
right? And but there's, as but there's a double explosion. That's what most people miss. We have the Big Bang starting, and it, and it grows. But then in the 70s, inflation. Alan Guth introduced the inflationary model, where if you look at the math, something maybe the size, maybe something a millimeter in diameter, instantly becomes 10 light years in diameter. That's what we're talking about. It's not just a, a gradual mm. spreading. And it happens, in, the mathematics works out to be one quintillionth of a femtosecond. Yeah, yeah. Which is faster than the fastest possible subatomic wiggle of any smallest particle imaginable. That this is not science. This is literally waving a magic wand over tremendous theoretical yeah. problem. And we're not trying to ridicule this. I mean, no, because but that's, this that's is, what it is. It's a mathematical trick. This is exactly the, the basic concept of the Big Bang. So out of nothing comes something mm -hmm. that then explains everything that we see today. And, yeah, and, but in, along the way, there's no explanation because there's no reason for it to start. There's no reason for the inflationary period to start. There's no reason for the inflationary period to start when it starts, to expand as much as it does, to expand as fast as it does, or to stop. Yeah, but when I say it explains everything, yes, it's not a, a sufficient explanatory model, but it explains how the universe and how life, that's what it seeks to do. It's that's the what it seeks to do, yeah. It's the foundation of that. And so I often say to people when, you know, skeptics come at me because I'm a Christian, I'm a creationist, and they say, well, you just resort to God, a supernatural trick. But actually, the Big Bang is the evolutionary concepts have their own supernatural trick because Absolutely. everything they invoke about this defies everything we know about the physical laws that govern our universe. Yeah. There's another one. Uh, in that concept, you know, if people remember E equals MC squared, right? Uh, at the time of the Big Bang, what we have is all this matter, but there should be an equal amount of antimatter. Antimatter. Where is it? It doesn't exist as far as we know. So, Almost all of the universe is matter. So that would in indicate. But wait, wait, wait. Most people think antimatter is just science fiction. No, you can it, make it in a lab. Yeah, Very difficult, but like, you can make you know, it in Well, a positron lab. emission tomography is using positrons, which is the antimatter yeah. particle of an electron. So we can make. In fact, you could have an entire universe filled with nothing but antimatter, and it'll work just fine. Or you can have it filled with matter, and it'll work just fine. But if those two things ever touch, they blow up in significant ways. So where is all the antimatter, and how come it didn't annihilate the matter? Why does matter even exist? Is a puzzle that the Big Bang theory has yet to grapple well, with. Well, if the viewers are Trekkies out there, they'll know that this enterprise has matter-antimatter propulsion systems, so they're able to control it. So there's another problem. This was cited as evidence of the Big Bang. And that is when we look at in the universe, there's this cosmic background radiation, microwave radiation. And this is supposed to be an afterglow of the Big Bang, but it backfired on them, claiming that was evidence for the Big Bang because we've now measured the temperature of it everywhere. Yeah. It is even. Too so, even. Yes. So there's not enough it, time. Because the early Big Bang would have had some lumpiness to it. Yeah. And those lumps are not evident in the radiation we see. It's very smooth. All right, go ahead. So, Rob, on the table, you've got a hot cup. Yeah, I've, I do. I've got a cold glass of water. Now, if I okay. put my glass of water against your hot cup, over time, that temperature is going to even out. Sure will. Right? It takes time to do it. Yeah. And so when we look at this cosmic background radiation, we see an even temperature. And even in a 14 billion year old universe, they don't have enough time for that yeah. temperature to even out. We call it the horizon problem. So and one, one reason for that is because the various parts of the universe are very far apart. Yeah. In a Big Bang model, we can theoretically see out 13 point something billion light years. It's called the Hubble volume. But if we look to the left, 13 billion light years, and to the right, 13 billion light years, those parts are 26 billion light years That's apart. That's exactly right. They can't actually see each other. Yeah. They're too far away to see. The temperature, the, the energy is no time to go from one point to the other. Yeah. And it will never get there. And yet it's equally distributed. So that's their problem, not ours. And we like to point it out. So we could talk about this for ages. And that's why could. I wrote a 420 page book on the subject. But a lot of objections are about advanced technology. Well, you can't say in the future, we can't develop this. And it's yeah, true. We can't. Yeah. We don't sense. know what, what we would. But to get spacecraft traveling at multiple factors of light speed, as we showed in the movie, and we've got a great uh, animation on that. If you even hit a speck of dust Boom. at one tenth of the speed of light, that's like 10 tons of TNT going off in your spaceship. Now, we know the Starship Enterprise has, has deflector arrays and all this type of stuff. And 
You know, when you're doing U-turns at warp factor six, they've got inertial dampeners to affect. But, but that is science fiction. Yes, it is. And uh, Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Safety has got a great article about G-forces, and it shows that even to accelerate to, you know, even half light speed at a rate that physical bodies could stand, it takes you hundreds of years, and then you've got to slow down at the other end. So again, these are science fiction concepts. Um, whilst there is some well, loose was, science behind it, uh, the idea that we would develop technologies to do that is actually not very realistic. The possibility of someone being able to manufacture a wormhole is all, oh, they just make a wormhole and that's what they're flying through. But the energy that would be required for that, you had to fold space itself. I mean... And the gravitational effects would mean you'd be crushed and your, your craft would be crushed. Yeah, so, it, it's, it's all science fiction. So here's the issue. We said... Where are we getting to? Life can only arise by one or two mechanisms. When we look at it on Earth, it either evolved or it was created, it was designed. When we look elsewhere in the universe, they're the only two games in town as well. And as you know, on creation.com, we have lots and lots of evidence for the design and the creator God of the Bible. When we look at the universe, uh, like we look at Earth, we see many, many objections to the evolutionary paradigm. So the Big Bang, as we've discussed, can't account for the spiritual realm. But again, the Bible does allow and says there is a spiritual realm. So again, even with this kind of weird subject, the evidence suggests that the Bible is true. So considering all the evidence, aliens cannot exist. In a strictly naturalistic sense, uh, the physics is just impossible as far as them coming and visiting us. From a biblical position, they're not there. We are a unique creation in the universe. In fact, in one sense, the universe is created for humans. Yeah. In order for God to bring about the bride of Christ. That's a pretty profound theological idea. Yeah. Um, also, the alien stories, clearly they're not coming here to save us. Those things are mean. People get tortured and tormented by them. That doesn't sound like a advanced alien race. It sounds more like uh, spiritual beings who are hostile to humans. Well, the creator of the universe had something to say about that. He said about the devil, he is a liar, the father of lies. There is no truth in him. Yeah. All the stories differ. Sometimes they claim there are creators, but they all come from different places, so they can't all be telling the truth. I mean, you know, people have lots of opinions on this. I would encourage them to look at our website, watch the Alien Intrusion movie, and most of all, look, look at the book. I mean, that's why we produce information, is so people can be informed on the subject. Lastly, I want to encourage people, if you're thinking that aliens are like exciting and they're coming here to give us new technology or save humanity or something, save from what? And what ultimate salvation are you talking about? Because they're not going to give us eternal life. They're no. not going to remove sin. They're not going to remove evil and wickedness and selfishness. There's no hope of salvation in alien technology or alien races. So you're actually misplacing your hope. Our, our only hope for salvation is on the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. And Rob, that's really important because at the beginning we talked about a government report. Yeah. And I said, and I predict, that in years to come we may have official sources saying we are visited by aliens. So as Christians, I would encourage people not to be troubled by that. And that's why you need to get this information. So if we pique your curiosity with this subject, we would really appreciate it if you would like this video, share this video, click on the, uh, the bell on YouTube so that you can be notified of future episodes of creation.com talk. If you're listening on podcasts, please share this. Tell other people how exciting this sort of information is. We're working really hard to produce faith-affirming, science-defending information for the discerning Christian. It's a lot, I mean, literally a lot of work. We have multiple people here at CMI. We're constantly batting around new ideas and we're, here, we're doing this for you because we want to affirm your faith and encourage you in your walk. Yeah.